My name is Catrice, everybody, as you know, and I'm with Bantu Cola, and I have David Alexander the third on the phone with us, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the stuff that's going on so that we can make sure that we get the information correct about what's happening right now in the state of Florida and in the, in the county as well. David, a few seconds ago, I was talking to you and we were talking about um, the laws that have, that have have been changed recently. One of the laws in particular is that now in the community, in the state of Florida, you have the right to open carries basically. And I'm, I'm wondering how that's going to affect uh, the community, um, the black community as a whole specifically, and how the police department or the sheriff's department will handle um, the community from this point on simply because of those laws being changed. Well, one of the things, uh, and this is why uh, back when I ran for sheriff, I, I really put a, uh, a lot of emphasis on professionalism uh, over politics, because one of the things politics will do is set a policy in motion and, pe and the public will react to it. And whereas professionalism, there's a standard of performance uh, that's to prevent crime, as well as in your response to crime and then collecting data to make sure we stay on the cutting edge of fighting crime. And, and as we were beginning to talk, um, it is important that the community uh, has buy-in to crime prevention strategies so that um, together police and citizens can, can, can make uh, what we call public safety optimum as possible. Uh, so the laws with open carry creates not only a challenge for citizens, but it's a challenge for law enforcement as well. It's dangerous for the public. It's dangerous for law enforcement as well. And see, whereas the issue of, 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 of gun violence has been weaponized uh, to be uh, racially divisive, um, if you go back and start looking at the race of violent offenders that have been making national news, it's a very well diverse group of people, which yes. means it is a people issue and not one particular race or even particular gender. And uh, so politics have really created a greater divisiveness in response to it. And when laws like this are passed, they're usually politically motivated and not well thought out as to how can we protect gun rights and at the same time maintain a certain standard of public safety. So, um, and then when you put in um, you put into the quotient all of the already existing problems, such as, you know, childhood trauma, um, mental illness, um, uh, you know, job uh, market decline, um, uh, unprepared workforce and a changing workforce, you know, workforce right. become more technology driven and people, the technology skills that people have is more along the line of entertainment and not about employment. The other thing is soft skills, being able to communicate has been lost and it has created a lot of unrealistic expectations, which leads to a lot of frustration. So now the psychology behind this is that people tend to become more impatient. So now when you become more impatient, um, you're looking for a quick response to something that made you angry. So rather than thinking your way through, you're going to do something that's going to be more of an impulse. So now um, you can go into any age group you want and there's frustration that leads to impulsive behavior. So if you're quick to go and improve to somebody, you're not the one to mess with, or you're just... Uh, you might be a little afraid, but rather than thinking your way through it and making some good decisions, you are so I'm just going to go get my gun or you just got the gun on you and start shooting or you got angry because of what you saw. And now you taking uh, extreme measures. I just read in the news today that a woman had been arrested 
uh, for um, attempting to run over a man in the car. So you say to yourself, what in the world could have driven her to the point where she got frustrated? And there is a conference going on uh, this weekend, starting, uh, I think, Friday, um, where they're, they're dealing with the frustration uh, of women, what women are frustrated by, overcoming their frustrations. But when they do these conferences and it has a gender tag on it, like a men's uh, breakfast or prayer breakfast or women's prayer breakfast, it is not designed to be gender biased. It's just that those, that particular gender group is the immediate focus, but really there are usually golden nuggets that apply across gender that people can employ to use to overcome certain situations. So frustration, just by its very nature, leads to an impulsive reaction to something that you are feel like you're stuck in, something that you feel like you've been taken down to your lowest estate and embarrassed by, or something that you become overwhelmed with fear that only you at the time can articulate it, but will nobody else be able to understand how was you so afraid that you did this and you did that? Or you're trying to impress or to keep from being embarrassed, publicly humiliated, so you're gonna to exalt to ex extreme measures. So now, when you add that to the problem we already had in public safety and law enforcement, it takes it to a whole nother level. Now, it's no, it's no, it's, it's no telling what you're gonna see in the news because there's no cap to it. So hmm. now if we don't have leaders that are willing to reset and start working together in law enforcement, it's going to get to the point where law enforcement is going to be nothing but merely reactionary and there will be no proactive measures because they're going to be sitting there trying to protect themselves from being openly attacked. And we've already had incidents that have made national news where officers have been sitting and they were a target of a random attack. So now when your protectors, your your public safety re first responders are going to be focused on their own well, their well-being and safety, it's going to put the public at an even more vulnerable rate. So then when you get, you break it down, because you can't just lump all violent behavior into one category. Right. When you start to compartmentalize, some of it is domestic violence, some of it is youth uh, dating violence, some of it is um, teens uh, just out getting into mischief, uh, uh, violent behavior, some of it is gang related, some of it is drug related, uh, some of it is just a person is mentally ill and they're in a crisis state of being and they got a gun. So, so it could be so many different things and that's why it's just not it, it, it's not sufficient enough to just say gun violence or violence in the community, but you got to look at various sources because that that kind of identifies the key players that you need to get to the forefront of this. Because right now in mental health, uh, there's a lot of money being thrown at public or community mental health solutions. But are you going to hit the folks that really need the, uh, in a crisis state already? Are you going to identify those um those uh suspects that are out there you know they're just the next violent act waiting to happen so what strategically are we doing to try to either track or monitor uh where they are and what they're getting involved in because it seems like this stuff tends to escalate a lot of times into something that's terrible and then the community reacts to it well at the same time the community is becoming numb to the whole idea that somebody got killed yesterday. Yeah, that's something that I also want to ask you about because um, gun violence has been a really big deal in, in Pensacola lately because there's been so much of it. And so my, my, my next question is right now, um, because we are, be, it seems like we are becoming numb to what's going on. What are some of the things that we can do in the black community that can stop some of that? Because that is getting more serious, see more and more shootings that taking place in Pensacola. But it's, it seems like even though we have the sheriff's department and the police department reaching out to the community, it's still not hitting home in the right places. So what do we need to do in order for us to kind of hone in on this area? 
Well, it needs to be part of our cultural uh, activities now. You know, churches can't afford to be silent about it because there's violence. Uh, there's violence being brought to the church. Um, your youth group cannot afford to be silent about it because they're they have team members on your youth teams that are absent because of violence. Um, uh, uh, your social fraternities cannot afford to be silent about it because they're impacted directly or indirectly. Sororities the same. Uh, it, it, so every arena uh, in, in your so in your public settings where we come together to to do something, how we're going to deal with violence has to be a conversation in there. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a formal or informal in that setting, you got to talk about it. You can't just sit there and say, well, well what the sheriff going to do with it? Well, because he, they may have had their mindsets already set when they came into the position that there was only so much they were willing to do in terms of crime. But then when crime becomes a topic of discussion as to whether you will be retain your position if you're appointed or if you'll be reelected, well, then we want to pull all these people together and start talking. But you're not pulling the right people together to talk. And then the question becomes, do you have the credibility to even host that conversation? Because if you just in a position, but you're not necessarily a person who has reached out to everyone, you reached out and you empowered certain people to be a representation, but they're not a real representation. Exactly. So that's why that's why that conversation had to start within, because then when it starts within the culture of black people, then you're going to you're going to be able to sense whether others who are not directly impacted by it as you are, you're going to sense whether they're serious about it. And they're not going to be able to just give you a political or a uh, a tech savvy response to a, a real question. Uh, they're not tracking crime like they should be. And they're saying they're waiting on some elaborate system. But that's like that's like saying to you, OK, you know, black people are dying. So I need black people to support me getting this this elaborate crime information system when you don't collect what you should be collecting now. Hmm. And what you don't collect, you don't have to report on because you can't. Okay. So if you're really concerned about the black community and crime, then act like it. You should every time you come to a meeting, this is the shootings we've had. This is the violent crimes we had. This is what's related to this. This is related to domestic violence. So I need Favor House. I need every domestic violence advocate. I need every person that has been speaking out against domestic violence to be at the forefront of this issue about domestic violence. I need people advocating for domestic violence to call their pastors, call their leaders out. What's your stance on it? I want to see your actions towards it. So don't just tell me you support this, but what action steps can you take that shows me, that shows the public that you're in support of? So that's what we got to do. When you start addressing crime, serious violent crime in a community, we got to, as a community, we got to demand that there are real action steps being put in place and not just we're giving uh, you know, the popsicle answers or the lollipop responses that sweetens the tongue. And so you say, okay, that's nice. And then you walk away and the next day or uh, while you're talking, you know, a violent crime is being committed and there's no difference in the way it was responded to. So quick question. How is it that I, I, I've been here for almost 30 years now. And when I first got here, there was hard. I mean, there was crime, but it was hardly any crime that really took place in this area, especially um, in the black communities. I mean, it happened, but it wasn't as bad as it is now. What is going on that that we've gotten so many shootings and so much crime that's been happening in the, this local area? Where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from a, a it's coming from a, a, a number of different angles and, and they say there's a crime-free community in anywhere in this world you're pretty much putting that area on 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 notice to be the next place right. okay so but can crime be at a manageable level because of community involvement and your public safety plan brings people together rather than divide people um but you know to go back to what you said 30 years ago um, is about the time when they really start to cut a lot of funding towards mental illness and mm. mental health. So a lot of treatment 
uh, protocols were in place 30 years ago are no longer in place. Now they're too expensive. And the question is going to be who's going to pay for it. So you can't go and get help with mental illness like you could have prior to 30 years ago. Uh, okay. it, there was emphasis being placed on that. So here's what has happened. A lot of childhood traumas that could have been mitigated either through school counseling or mental health counseling, it wasn't, so it didn't go away. It grew into a problem, and this became how people responded to dealing with their traumatic experience. Uh, so this is why we were talking about uh, trauma-informed community uh, because it had a direct implication for law enforcement. It had a direct implication for uh, IE, high profile crimes involving black males being killed uh, because of the perception or the actual act of violence and they were actually mentally ill. So there were so many different things that have fed into this violent wave, uh, not to mention that, um, you know, while marriage has always been a challenge, but it became questionable over the last 30 years to the point is, what does it mean to be married? So now there's a whole lot of things that uh, our social institutions were able to address and stay ahead of. Now even books and what's taught in the school uh, is questionable. It's politically driven, it's politically motivated. And so now all of these things uh, will not even one be singly responsible, but when you put them all into the, to the mix of how they impact the way people think, and then the levels of frustration that people are going to experience, it goes back to it leads to compulsive, impulsive responding to frustration, and usually it ends up in violence. Because with poor school achievement, then most people are, are not willing to talk about or they lack the vocabulary to talk about things so they can work through conflict. So it's a number of different things, but all of these failing systems that we have in our country right now has some implication toward the level of violence that we're going to experience in our community. And certainly if it's a, a, a economically disenfranchised uh, segment of the community, then you're going to see that even more uh, pervasive, the levels of violence increase. Another question. Um, we're, so I understand the whole aspect of what you're saying concerning violence. But but some of these kids, how are they getting a hold of guns to be able to shoot somebody? Because when I was growing up, yes, there was guns in the house. There was different things that we had, you know, for protection and everything. But it was never like it is now where a child can take a gun to school or you see shootings on the street with all of these people with all these guns. Where, where, where well, is this? Go ahead. Well, we, we, we've, we've allowed the... Uh, the hip hop culture, uh, the videos uh, have have perpetuated the need to carry guns. Guns have always been available on the streets. Uh, they're more available now than they ever been. And then strategically, what's to stop somebody who wants to wreak havoc in a community from taking a truckload of assault rifles and, and and dumping them in the community, and they and they just spread out over the community, and people use them to kill people. So there are so many ways that these guns are getting out here. And so when people start pushing gun laws and gun restrictions, it's not really dealing with where the real problem is going. Yes, you're going to get a few people here and there that legitimately walk in the, walked in the store, bought a gun, and went out and killed somebody. But a lot of these guns are not being purchased in the store and they're going out and killing folks. A lot of these crimes are from guns being bought on the streets, being readily available, and then there's no there's no street there's no street restrictions from what age you got to be to get a gun. Mm. If you got the money, you can go buy it, or you go break in a car and take it because people just careless and leave their cars unlocked, and they got guns in the cars. Or sometimes, you know, uh, there are some sick adults out there that are telling the child, "Hey, you take this to school, and ain't nobody bother you. You get them off for you." What kind of advice is that to give to a child? Yeah. So we've seen situations, not necessarily here, but in other places where a child, the gun, the parents knew the child had the gun. And so now you're seeing parents being charged uh, 
as a principle to a crime because they have foreknowledge. So, and, and then when you top it off, the, the, the moral compass of this world is, is increasingly declining. So now what an adult, a reasonable adult would never dare do, now they'll do it. Yeah. So, so, but, but at the same time, it seems like the laws are centered toward more restrictive measures on people who are law abiding than those who can go out here and they, you know, a person that's going to commit a crime, they're not going to raise their hand and ask permission. They're going to look for the opportunity and they're going to go commit the crime. That's you know? good. So, so that's why I say uh, to address this, first we got to take the politics out of it. Uh, there's some things that spread out across the board. You know, there got to be consequences when people cross the line and do the unthinkable. You know, there should be a zero tolerance. It's like right now for domestic violence. If you can get a domestic violence case into the courtroom, there's very little tolerance for it. And the courts have made their stance very clear. And people that advocate for that uh, are telling you, yeah, they're getting, they getting additional laws. They have had sentencing enhancements. Um, but, you know, uh, again, there has to be consequences that people are going to respect. I don't want that to happen to me. So therefore, that is not even on my list of responses if I get frustrated. You know, right. but nowadays people feel like they can go uh, commit the most heinous crime and they can, at the legal at the end of the day, they can find a legal defense because somebody has tried it and not to mention somebody done beat the system with that argument. So, so there are a number of different things, but what I would challenge your listeners and anybody else that's concerned about this issue. Number one, look at this whole issue and ask yourself, what can I do to be a part of the solution and not stand back and watch and subsequently be a part of the problem? And it's simple, very simple. Start to have that conversation within your group. Have some standards that people you associate, you affiliate with, are willing to embrace such as, hey, look, no, don't don't go along with the practice of getting angry and just, you know, abruptly uh, uh, acting out of your frustration. We should we should we should uh, we should condone that. We should withstand firm against that kind of behavior because it's feeding into this cycle of violence. Absolutely. And I believe when when if we can impress each other and encourage each other. Um, to do things that really are not good for us, we can we can encourage each other to do the right thing, which right now, violence is destroying families. For every child that's directly or indirectly exposed to a violent act, that child is probably having nightmares, and probably, probably having emotional problems that's not even being addressed because we have allowed talking to counselors uh, be, uh, be a, a way of stigmatizing ourselves as having mental problems. Even officers in the field need to know that they, at times, they're going to see stuff that's really they need to talk to a clinical professional about. And if they neglect to do it, they're cheating themselves. They're robbing themselves of some good days that they could experience while they do their job of public safety. But again, it's about removing that stigma that you're weak or that there's something wrong with you because you choose to talk to a counselor about something that was traumatic and when you experienced it. And sometimes the trauma can, can take place over a long period of time and just wear it out on you. But you gotta learn how to maintain uh, your personal wellness, your personal mental wellness by talking your way through situations rather than reacting impulsively. Okay. Um, do you know of any groups that are available for people to, to join in in the, in the community? Well, you know, uh, this coming Friday, uh, Overcoming Frustration Conference uh, is at the House of God Church. A young lady named by the name of Justina Williams, uh, Dr. Justina Williams, uh, told me about it. I'm going to try to go by there. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. There's a couple of funerals going on. So, you know, trying to get it all these different places at one time. But what I want to see is how this conversation will directly tie into 
how violence is escalating in places that we would never imagine. Uh, also, there's a musical workshop. I think the performing arts have always been a way to calm uh, some of the roughness of violence in our community. Uh, it works with, with juvenile violence and getting in trouble. It also works with adults because it allows us to take our messages and put them in a positive uh, spin and use the performing arts to get that message abroad to a lot of people. Um, you know, so uh, there's men prayer and breakfast coming up. Uh, there's a lot of other events coming up. I'm going to be asking. So I would definitely like to follow up with you because there could be a community coalition of people that come together and begin to dissect this whole problem of community violence. And then you're able to go to elected officials with your own demands of them because they are operating off of tax dollars and they should be working for us and not telling us uh, that we should be working for them and we're paying them to do the job. So I think if we can get a coalition of people who are really serious about addressing violence overall, and then let's look at creative ways where we can get our younger generation involved. You know, I'm going to tell you something about the younger generation. When they embrace something and when they find a cause, they'll, they'll support it wholeheartedly. And that's what D.A.R.E. did for so many years. It didn't keep every kid from fooling with drugs, but there were a lot of kids that bypassed drugs because of the message that D.A.R.E. Uh, instilled in them. And, and then they were able to take that from, from, from uh, elementary school to middle school, from middle school to high school, and they still remember that their officers, their school resource officers. So there's some things that worked, but we, uh, because in the name of progression, in the name of technology driven, we got away from some of those things that simply work. But any genuine interaction between people for a common cause, there's bound to be some positive results. Absolutely. So I think we have what it takes. It's just do we have the people it takes to make it happen. I think that in the next couple of um, conversations that we have for sure that we need to try to see about some of those people that we can get to come together. And let me just say this, if you're watching this video, please, 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 if you know of any different organizations that deal with violence, period, not just domestic violence because violence is happening, whether it's domestic or whether it's outside of the family or what have you. Let's talk about it. Drop your post, your, your information in a post so we can find out where these some of these areas are that we can talk about and actually come together and meet as a group. And this is not just about victims. It's for the, the perpetrators as well. Because if people are crying out for help and they're frustrated because there's nowhere to turn, you know, there are some solutions out there before it resorts uh, to violence. So this is, this is addressing the whole issue and not just a fragmentized yeah yeah because yeah, sometimes that's one of the things that i've i've noticed is that they all we always turn to the victims but we never turn to the people that are the perpetrators of the, the cause of what happened because they also have issues that we need to deal with so again Absolutely. if anyone knows of anyone um any groups or organizations that are having these conversations drop the post in, at the bottom of your of the chat on the bottom of our our um information and we'll contact you so we can try to start these conversations in the community um Mr. Alexander, I appreciate you so much for coming on and talking. I look forward to talking with you again for sure. And I hope that um, we're able to really continue this so that we can try to get this message out to our people so we can really work towards it. Thank you for your time. No problem. Teamwork makes a dream work. I look forward <laughs> to it.